seven. I come from a family that's very diehard Republican, and it doesn't matter who's elected. It drives me up a wall that the Democrats have put so much money into these far-right, uh, you know, Republican candidates. He's, he's just way too extreme, and it's just, he's just so off-putting. I've been a Republican for 45 years. We don't like the government up in our business. Don't reverse Roe versus Wade. That's about control. It's about controlling women. But I also was kind of upset about what President Biden did recently. He forgave all the loans. And I really scrimped and I saved and I sacrificed my my home, my car. I drove a crappy car for years and I paid my loans. And I'm really angry about that. It's Notes from America. I'm Kai Wright, and welcome to the show. All of those voices you just heard were from voters and focus groups held in key states in recent weeks. Their focus groups convened by Sarah Longwell, who is publisher of The Bulwark. She's been listening to voters in these groups throughout this whole election cycle. And in each one, she collects a distinct group, Democratic voters, Died in the wool MAGA voters, and then this third fascinating group, the modern day swing voter, which for Sarah is someone who voted for Donald Trump in 2016 and then Joe Biden in 2020. And we had Sarah Longwell on way back at the start of the primaries, so we brought her back now for our final show before election day uh, to check in on these focus groups. So, Sarah, hey again. Hey, happy to be here. Thanks for having me. And just so listeners understand, you do have a particular interest here. You, you're Yes, you're doing this work for your podcast at The Bill Work, which, by the way, is called The Focus Group. Uh, so the name describes it. Uh, but also you were and still are one of the founding members of this movement of Republicans and conservatives who tried to stop Trump's takeover of the party uh, and who are now thinking about how to just counter MAGA and the election lies more generally. Is that a fair way to describe your, your mission here? Oh, yeah, that's fair. I mean, we are we're in these races. I mean, I have campaigns running in a lot of these swing states trying to defeat these anti-democracy Republicans. And so one of the main reasons I do the focus groups um, besides the fact that I really want people to hear what people are saying, uh, is to understand what is motivating people and to understand how to best persuade them in these moments. Yeah. yeah. And, and so with that in mind, one of the big and maybe alarming to you takeaways uh, from these months and months of focus groups you've been doing is that the swing voters, again, these are the people who went from Trump to Biden, uh, Trump to Biden, uh, over the course of this past year, more and more of them have told you that they regret that choice. Wh wh why do they say that? Yeah, you know, in the beginning, so shortly after Biden was elected and in the months after, they never regretted their votes. Like, yeah, I always talk to swing voters all the time. And even though they weren't that happy with how things are going, this was around sort of Delta, Afghanistan, um, you know, they still... Were, they didn't regret it. They could were glad that mm -hmm. Donald Trump, somebody described him as a car alarm that had been going off <laughs> and that someone had finally shut it off. And they like just that relaxation was still with people. But in the last, you know, this back half here, the last eight months or so, mm -hmm. uh, we've seen a lot of backsliding. People, now not everybody, and and probably not even a majority, you just hear more people saying they regret their vote. You hear more people saying if Trump ran again, they'd vote for him this time. And the reason is, um, you know, there's among all the groups pretty uniformly, there's just a ton of pessimism. Um, mm -hmm. And and I would say certainly in the MAGA groups uh, and the Trump voting groups, there's a lot of catastrophizing, you know, uh, and people talk across the political spectrum about things like gas prices, uh, housing prices, uh, the inflation and what it costs to go to the grocery store. Um, if you listen to people, you know, the they are reacting to the the just the what everything costs. And that is the thing that is dominating um, not their votes, actually, but their sense of how things are going in the country, which is they think it's going badly. Yeah. And do they regret Biden specifically? Are they like, you know what? This was the wrong choice. 
It's not, I mean, it's, I think it's just, yeah. I mean, I guess, yes, because that was their choice. And so these were, um, these were, so, and, and it, you know, it's actually, there's two types of voters that we think of as, as kind of, there were people who went for Biden, who went for Trump in 16 and then Biden in 20. And then there's people who just didn't vote for Trump in 20. Like they voted mm -hmm. for him in 16, but they went third party or they, they wouldn't cast the vote for either of them. We get a fair number of those people. And I would actually say it's the latter category, the third party voters, the people who just didn't vote who now feel like, well, things are really bad and I should have voted for yeah. Trump because look how things are going. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, you know, to be fair, everybody, this is, this is a, as you said, this is across voters. There is a lot of fear and concern about where we stand right now. Would you say that that pessimism you're describing is, is that different than the, you know, we've heard pessimism from voters for a long time now, you know, I mean, is it of a qualitative difference this time around that you've been hearing or is it just sort of, this is what happens? Yeah, you know, it's it's it, that's a good question. And and in some ways, like things were this is how people were talking before, too, because for a lot of the focus group time I've been doing them, we were in COVID right. and people were miserable during <laughs> right. COVID, you know, and they thought things were going terribly. Uh, and and back then, I mean, uh, the stories that people would tell of the depression and their families or yeah. not being able to go to funerals, the loss, um, you know, their kids being out of school that, you know, the 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 things parents were dealing with. And so I can't say that I have had a period of time. And, and then even prior to that, a lot of the groups I was talking to going into, um, you know, Trump's reelection, I was also talking to a lot of people that I would have said were persuadable Trump voters. Mm -hmm. So, so people who had voted for Trump, but rated him as doing a very bad job. And so they were also always unhappy because they didn't like Trump and didn't like that they'd voted for him. So I think it's fair to say that people have been sort of unhappy now for a long stretch of time. Um, but I think that the big difference that people kind of, where they look back is if they have regret, they'll tell you a lot of it is the economy. They were like, yeah, you know, he was a jerk and I couldn't stand him, but at least the economy was doing well and my 401k and the market. And that's the kind of thing that yeah. people, people will say. Yeah. Yeah. And, and can we just talk about why this group of voters matters? I mean, you, you know, like beyond the horse race of it all, because in the political media, I feel like, you know, we I, we all often very often fetishize a group of voters, particularly like as we run up to Election Day. And this is a relatively small group of people we're talking about, actually. So to you, why just spell out like why this is such an important group of people? Yeah, so there's lots of different types of swing voters. You know, for a lot of people, there are Obama Trump voters, which tend to be white um, working class voters. But for us right now, and, and like I said, when I was thinking about persuasion going into 2020 and how I would persuade sort of Trump voters to not vote for him again, I was talking to people who voted for him but rated him as doing a very bad job. And so then that was our target audience. Mm -hmm. Our target audience this time are the Trump uh, 16, Biden 20 voters because those are the people who were decisive in the last election, mm. right? So these are the people who put Biden over the top. And if you assume, as happened in, in 2020, that both parties are essentially able to turn out their people, then you've got to fight for these swing voters. Mm -hmm. Now, these swing voters, though, that this category of them that we're talking to right now, the Democrats need to hold on to because they're the ones who put Joe Biden over the edge by those narrow margins in the swing states, which is where the competitive, um, you know, races are right now, these voters are actually sort of center right, which mm -hmm. is the, the problem, I think, for Democrats is a lot of them, you know, they voted for Trump the first time because they thought of themselves as Republicans. And they sort of liked that he was a businessman and they were willing to take a shot on him. But then, and, and they're also, they're not like these white working class Trump Obama voters. They tend to be more college educated suburban voters that are the kinds of people that are kind of trending blue. They're sort of trending more Democrat these days, but because there's a political realignment, a trade going on where, you know, more of these white working class voters, these mm -hmm. Obama Trump voters, they are more and more culturally aligned with sort of the magnification of the Republican Party. Right. And so to Democrats, they need to pick up these college educated suburban sort of swing voters this time. And with these very Trumpy candidates, that's kind of the target that I think people are vote are fighting over. You know, Mitch McConnell, they really want to put back their coalition of suburban voters <laughs> right. uh, with rural voters. And so that's kind of who we're fighting for in places like Arizona, in places like Georgia, 
where Herschel Walker and Carrie Lake and Blake, you know, these are very Trumpy candidates. And so as much as these, these folks tend to be center right, they also don't like MAGA candidates, right? Mm -hmm. I always talk about them like they have this Reagan hangover. Um, Reagan where hangover? They, yeah, they're like, they're like, they still like limited government and free markets. And they are always like, man, is Paul Ryan going to run again, do you think? <laughs> and they just, they just don't have a sense of how much the Republican Party has changed that it ain't going back to the Reagan times. Yeah. Listeners, uh, Sarah and I can take your calls while we talk. It, I'm particularly interested if you are one of these Trump to Biden voters, or maybe you're a Republican who just can't get down with the MAGA movement in general. What's on your mind as you vote? 844-745-TALK. That's 844-745-8255. Or, you know, we can also take anybody's questions for Sarah Longwell. Uh, 844-745-TALK or drop it in YouTube uh, if you're watching there. Uh, and Sarah, you know, before we take a break here, one of the things that's, I think, interesting listening to your podcast is like you have on these other folks who are political professionals like yourselves, and there is something that gets lost in sort of the bedside manner um, of the conversation, because like you're, you guys, you're in these, you know, your specialty in this, it's kind of like listening to doctors talk about people's heart disease. And, and this is like stuff that is of such huge consequence. And I just, I do wonder, like, are you listening to these focus groups? Are you as calm and clinical um, in your emotions as you sound and when you talk about them? Yeah, I think so. I mean, first of all, I'll, I'll tell you one of the, it is helpful. I like people and I like most of these people. Like when you talk to them for two hours every week, you know, even tough sort of Trump voters will talk about how they take care of their sick parents and how much they're worried about their kids or, um, you know, they, they volunteer at the local dog shelter. And so like, I, I understand, I get a lot of grief sometimes from people who are like, do not humanize mm -hmm. these horrible Trump voters. But like they are humans and they are like our fellow citizens. And my job, this is the thing, people are always like, why don't you yell at them when they say things that are wrong? Or why don't you push back and tell them that their facts are wrong? And I always respond with, I want to listen to 10 people explain something to me so that I can persuade 10,000 people. Like if I can't understand what's really going on, then I can't do the job of, of cause you do have to be sort of clinical about it. If, if you're, and I think this is part of the problem is that a lot of progressives, you know, they're, they, they, they want to fight Trump, but they don't understand the voters and how to do it. Hold that thought, Sarah. Sarah Longwell is publisher of The Bulwark. We're going to take a break and we'll be right back. Hi, this is Doug calling from Monterey County, California. I am a longtime fan of Kai Wright and a longtime fan of Sarah Longwell. As a conservative, I don't know that anything is at stake for me in the midterms, and that's what troubles me so much. I have believed for many decades that 
an anti-racist, pro-capitalist person is conservative and it feels like the conservative movement is now at least racist curious and anti-capitalist. And I wish that these midterms were going to reveal whether my views are still conservative and I'm sorry they won't. It's Notes from America. I am Kai Wright, and I am with Sarah Longwell, publisher of The Bulwark. And Doug, thanks for your longtime support for both of us. Uh, Sarah, that's one of the voicemails we got from a podcast listener who uh, heard the advanced promo for this episode. And heads up to listeners, you can always leave us a voice message right on our website at notesfromamerica.org. Just record it right there on the site. But Sarah, respond to Doug's despondence there in that message. What would you say to his feeling that, you know, as a conservative, there's nothing for stake, at stake for him in this election? Well, I, I guess I don't quite know what he means by nothing at stake. There is a uh, great deal at stake in terms of the people that we elect in 2022. They're going to certify the election in 2024. And so to have Donald Trump on the precipice of announcing that he is going to run again, uh, to have it happen when a bunch of people that he basically anointed in their Republican primaries who owe, who who may may or may not win uh, in the, you know, on Tuesday, mm -hmm. but if they do, they will owe him a great debt. Uh, and, you know, these, many of these governors and secretaries of state who, who denied elections, they'll be in a position to certify elections going forward. So that matters a great deal. Um, I will say there's probably not a sadder group uh, in America right now than the swing voters that I talk to. Like just, they're so conflicted. The people sort of on, they are center right. A lot of times they are moderate Republicans uh, and they think that the Republican party has lost its mind. They don't think that there are candidates that they can vote for. And I think for a lot of people, there's a realization that's dawning on them that I had that dawned on me, but uh, a while back, but mm -hmm. I think you can forgive people who don't do politics professionally for realizing it later that, Donald Trump fundamentally changed what the Republican Party is. I think for a lot of people, I certainly thought this. When I was trying to defeat Trump in 2020, I thought if you could, if Biden just like beat him by 10 points and it was a thorough repudiation of Donald Trump, that the Republican Party would see this was a mistake. A lot of, you know, and and, and it, would, it would reform itself. Like the muscle, old muscle memory would kick back in. And it became very clear uh, after January 6th that Trump was... Uh, to the extent that Trump was a cancer on the party, he had metastasized. And as you look across the 20, 2022 landscape, it's just a bunch of mini Trumps. It's just a bunch of people who are aping both his style and, and substance design. Huge I don't know numbers of people who are but, just election deniers, open election that's right. deniers. Right. That's right. I mean, the 70% of the party does not believe that the last election was free and fair. And that is a result of what I call the Republican triangle of doom which is sort of the toxic and symbiotic relationship between the right-wing infotainment media, the voters, and elected officials. Because for a while, it was just Trump saying it, but then right-wing media really leaned into it, and then all the elected officials felt like need they needed to say it. And pretty soon, all the voters believed it. Not only that, but it was basically the toll you had to pay to get Trump's endorsement in 2022 in all of these races. And that's, you know, that saddled us with a whole bunch of candidates now some of whom are poised to win, mm -hmm. uh, who are election deniers. Right. I, I want to play a clip from one of your episodes that sort of cuts in a different direction than, than this part of the conversation. You held a focus group with their swing voters in Georgia a few weeks ago. Uh, and listeners, that a reminder that Georgia is very likely uh, to decide control of the Senate. And, you know, that's the race between Herschel Walker and Raphael Warnock. And both gubernatorial candidates are big figures in the national conversation. So this is a really important state. Anyway, listen to how some of Sarah's swing voters, so again, people who voted Trump in 2016, Biden in 2020, how they talk about Democratic Senator Raphael Warnock. One thing that I do like that he does is he's not a strict Democrat. He does go across the party lines a lot if he believes in the cause. And I think that's a very positive quality of a politician. Etiquette wise, he's very approachable, but I don't know as far as rubber meeting the road that he goes across the aisle too much. I'm just feeling like he's followed suit with the Democrat agenda 
through and through on Biden and other things. But he has done a good job going out to uh, Georgia businesses. And uh, I've seen some press releases about him visiting and taking the time out to look into specific needs in certain industries and stuff. And in that case, I would say he's done a great job. I feel like Raphael, he just, he's done well. And I feel like he holds himself pretty well and he's good with debates, you know, but I also feel like that there's always like some sort of trap, right? That everyone's kind of getting caught in between. So I don't know. I, I am more always like leaning towards Warnock, but I also did, you know, vote for Trump. So, Sarah, these voters point to another one of like the big takeaways, I think, from your months and months of focus groups here. Uh, which is that we may truly see a lot of ticket splitting this time around. And this is one of those things that uh, people talk about, that strategy, political, you know, in political media, we hear about ticket splitters, but as I gather, it's actually not something that happens very often. Um, And you're hearing from people in Georgia and in other races, but let's talk about Georgia for a second, that this is likely, that there will be people who will vote for the Republican governor, gubernatorial candidate, and uh, and the Democratic senatorial candidate. What's going on here? Yeah, so uh, that Georgia group, the whole group was going to vote for Brian Kemp, the Republican governor. And everybody but one guy, and that guy was like very unsure, uh, was going to vote for Warnock. Uh, And so uh, this is actually happening in states across the country. And and like you said, the reason that it doesn't happen uh, as often as it used to is a lot of it's because of the polarization um, you know, people are just more tribal. And so there's a little less of the, why well, just vote for the best candidate? Like you just don't hear that quite as much anymore. But what's happening in these states now is you have, um, you know, these re- really like bad can like Republicans have a real candidate quality issue because of the people that Donald Trump um, sort of pulled across the finish lines in the primaries. And so, you know, they, in this, in Georgia's case, then there were there were three black women in this group, uh, I'll say, and they were not voting for Stacey Abrams. And mm-hmm. some of it's just the incumbency bias where they said, that guy's fine. You did a good job on COVID and I like Brian Kemp fine. Uh, and then, but they were like horrified by Herschel Walker, um, you know, just too much baggage, too much craziness, too many scandals. Uh, and so, but this is also happening in like place like Pennsylvania where you've got a governor's race between Josh Shapiro, um, the Democrat, and Doug Mastriano. Doug Mar- Mar- uh, Mastriano is one of these, like, maybe the scariest candidate on the ballot. About as radical uh, as it gets. As radical as it gets. Um, he was at January 6th. He, like, breached the lines on January 6th. He paid to bus people to January 6th. Um, and Josh Shapiro is actually well-known in the state. He's the AG. People really like him. So he is likely, so there's a bunch of people in the groups that are Josh Shapiro voters, uh, but they are going to vote for Oz, the swing voters, you know, and part of it is that Oz to them is one of the, they don't like him, negatives are high, they don't trust him, but they sort of want to vote for a Republican somewhere, mm-hmm. and they feel like he's safe enough. But the other place that it's happening in a big way is Ohio, which doesn't get as much attention. But right now, Tim Ryan is picking up at least 17% of DeWine voters, who is their Republican uh, governor in Ohio, who's going to cruise uh, to victory here in 20 uh, re-election. But Ryan is picking up a ton of DeWine voters and also, I think, Trump voters. Uh, and he's running very close with J.D. Vance. It's one of the few, I think, real bright offensive spots uh, for Democrats right now. And then there's even a weird one where in Arizona, I've uh, Mark Kelly is the incumbent Democratic senator. Uh, People are kind of like, he's okay. Blake Masters has been gaining on him, but like people like him fine. Again, incumbency bias, but they're going to vote for Carrie Lake, the Republican insane uh, person who's a big election denier. And so to have, there's like some Lake Kelly voters, which is, I think, one of the most surprising split tickets I've heard about. And, but I mean, you know, so that's a lot of facts that, that have come at us, but the, like, the point is that, well, let me suggest a point is the point that this is we're we are at a more, we hear so much about the nationalization of all local politics. Is this a, is this a hopeful sign um, that in this election, actually, a lot of these races are, in fact, local, that people care about what's happening in their state? I, I would love to take it as a hopeful sign because that's a good <laughs> optimistic thing to do. Unfortunately, I think it's a negative sign about how bad the candidates are on the Republican side, uh-huh. that there's a bunch of sort of Republican um there's a bunch of Republican governors and whatnot that people are fine with, uh, but they don't like 
the big the, the, like the the Republican Senate candidate is too much. Yeah. I would also they say they wouldn't otherwise be splitting their ticket. They would be they wouldn't otherwise be splitting their ticket. Uh, yeah. I think that if there was a Republican governor in the offing that was sort of a normal uh, style, like a, if there was a, a DeWine style for Pennsylvania, um, yeah, Republicans would be going for them. And and this is, but this is the, actually the bigger macro story. Republicans should be crushing these midterms. They should be running away with it. House, Senate, governor's races, inflation super high, Biden's not popular, taxes, or um, gas has been expensive. Like there's a million reasons why Republicans should be cruising to just uh, a shellacking and they're not. And the reason they're not is the candidate quality, uh, like plain and simple. Let's go to some calls here. Let's go to Scott in Union County, New Jersey. Scott, welcome to the show. Hey, what's up, guys? How are you today? We are good. What, what are you, what's on your mind, Scott? First, an op- first a quick question, then a detailed observation. Uh, the uh, focus group, you mentioned you try to persuade voters. Are you doing a non-biased pers- focus group, or is it totally focused on trying to get voters to vote Democratic? No. So this is, and this was the question that was being asked earlier. You said you're so clinical. And I said, that's because I'm, I'm not trying to persuade anybody in a focus group In the focus group. I'm just trying to understand them. But in my, in, then I go out into the world and I do create ads and campaigns to think about how to persuade similar types of voters. But in the groups, I am only trying to learn. And to be clear, sir, you're also, we're talking, talking about what you're, 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 you're supporting a rate a range of political candidates by party, um, but your op, your your effort is to support pro democracy candidates. Pro democracy candidates. So we did. A, we helped. There were Republicans. We helped in the um, primaries who were much better than their opponents. Um, and then now we're trying to defeat a bunch of anti democracy Republicans. Right. So just for time, I'm going to move on to the next call, Scott. But thank you. Let's go to Asa in Niantic, Illinois. Is am I pronouncing that right? Yeah. Awesome. Yeah, that's right. Welcome to the show, Asa. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, thanks. I, I like to listen in and, and see what all you guys have to say. Um, you know, we're kind of a small area here, but, I, you know, I feel like a lot of people around me are really just getting disgusted and frustrated that it's just been, you know, years of pessimism and years of frustration over elections and where things are going. And do you have any insight as to, like, do you think things are going to turn around and, and people are going to feel any positive direction about um, our political choices in the future, or is this really kind of the direction that we're going to be headed for quite some time? Thank you for that. I mean, I, 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 that's a good question, right? Like, as somebody who's talking to voters all the time, like, is this a death spiral we're in? Or... No, I love that question, because I don't think we're in a death spiral. Again, people are good. And here's the problem. Uh, so I never, I, I rarely blame voters. I blame elected officials for working actively to lie to people, to divide people. Um, I think one of the reasons that Biden was able to kind of get over the line was because he ran on kind of a a unifying message. And I think one of the frustrations is that people wanted us to be more unified by this point. You hear uh, so much frustration in the groups about how divided we are. Um, But honestly, here's, here's what I think pulls us out of it. And that's leadership. We are going to have to have somebody who comes along and says, hey, guys, it doesn't have to be this way. Like, who ha- who presents an optimistic vision for America, who talks about why we are already great, the great things we've done, the great things we could be. Um, and I don't know which party that's going to come from, but I do think that if we keep going in this vortex of backlashes, well, like, I can be terrible because they're terrible. I mean, I see this all the time with the Herschel Walker, where people are like, well, yeah, he's paid for some abortions and he didn't raise his children, but what about Bill Clinton? And as long as we're what abouting all the time, mm-hmm. like somebody's got to present an affirmative, positive vision for America uh, that I do think can can bring us back. Because I do think there's a big hunger for it. I think people are hungry. People don't want to live like this. No, people are tired. People are tired. Part of the, I think, you know, uh, pessimism of the moment is that we're all tired of it. Like we're just, we're, we're all tired. Let's go to Chris in Westerfield, in Weatherfield, Connecticut. Chris, welcome to the show. Yeah, hi. What is distressing me is that I would like to hear more about the uh, candidates' proposed solutions and, you know, discussion about solutions and debate about solutions 
you know, it's a, a lot of fun to talk about the horse race and who's doing what in the polls and what little tactics they're having, but it's the solutions that count. And uh, I agree with one of your other callers. Um, we need to recognize leaders. Part of recognizing a leader is to understand how they can solve problems, to see what their critical thinking uh, is, to be on the world stage as the you know, president of the United States of America. Thank you for that, Chris. Is that, in fact, something you hear in the focus groups, Sarah, that people want solutions? I mean, it, there's this is one of those things where it's like we say we want uh, healthy food, but we eat a lot of junk food, you know. Um, but but do you hear that in your focus groups? Yeah, I would say the parties are kind of different in this regard. Um, I would say Democrats tend to be much more focused on policy uh and like specific things like you get a lot of people that are like well we should be doing this on the environment or we should be doing this on energy um on the republican side uh i would say there's much oh i think we've lost sarah for a second we have lost sarah uh, but you know uh we're gonna see if we can bring her back but in the meantime uh we're gonna it, coming up because we're going to be able to take a break here in a second. Coming up, we're going to be able to hear, we're going to check in to, for in Arizona, where we're going to hear from a reporter who has been following the Latino vote, which is a whole nother group of people uh, who are going to be pivotal in this upcoming election. Uh, over the last 10 years, she's been tracking what the Latino vote, how, how Latino population has evolved po politically. Uh, so we're going to hear from her and we're going to hear a little bit uh, about what's happening there. And... Let's see, do we have Sarah back to say goodbye? We do not. So tell you what, we're going to wrap this segment up. Sarah Longwell was the, is the publisher of The Bulwark and host of the podcast, The Focus Group. Uh, we thank her for coming back on the show. It's always great to check in with her and hear, you know, what some of these voters are telling us. And listeners, like I said, if we didn't get to your call, we still want to hear from you. You can leave us a voice note right on our website. Just go to notesfromamerica.org and find the record button uh, and tell us what you're thinking as we go into this election. And like I said, coming up, we're going to turn our attention to Arizona, another pivotal state uh, with democracy literally on the ballot. That's all coming up. It's Notes from America. I'm Kai Wright. Twelve years ago, 
Arizona's Republican-led legislature passed one of the most harsh anti-immigrant laws in the country. The law, which came on the heels of a midterm election in which Republicans around the country ran hard on fear of undocumented immigrants, it became known as the Show Me Your Papers law. The bill I'm about to sign into law, Senate Bill 1070, represents another tool for our state to use as we work to solve a crisis that we did not create in the federal government. As a matter of policy, SB 1070 allowed police to stop and search anyone they suspected of not having the proper paperwork to be inside the U.S. As a matter of politics, it did even more than that. It became a messaging vehicle for driving home this relatively new idea at the time that being in the country without papers is a dangerous crime and one that calls for drastic, even authoritarian measures. There is no higher priority than protecting the citizens of Arizona. We cannot sacrifice our safety to the murderous greed of drug cartels. We cannot stand idly by. Governor Jan Brewer became a right-wing celebrity. Remember the tarmac moment when she infamously shook her finger at President Obama? And you could argue that Arizona and this law, they're both big parts of the MAGAverse origin story. But they are also big parts of the origin story for the modern immigrant rights movement. SB 1070 fueled enormous activism, particularly among the young, striving class of undocumented people who became known as dreamers. And that activism, it helped change the state's politics. It's at least part of how Arizona became a swing state in 2020. Just one Arizona, y'all. Anyway, all of that, it's the backstory to this week's hugely consequential election in Arizona, in which Latino voters in particular may be decisive. Republican gubernatorial candidate Carrie Lake has been called the new face of MAGA. She's a proud election denier and unapologetic about wanting to aggressively police undocumented people. Control of the U.S. Senate may well be decided in Arizona as well. But here's the thing. Turns out there's no reason to believe that Democrats can count on Latino voters to stop any of that. Polls both in Arizona and nationally show growing Latino support for Republican candidates. Journalist Maritza L. Felix joins us to help make sense of all of this. Maritza runs a new service for Spanish speakers called Conecta Arizona, and she comes to us from Feet in Two Worlds, which is a project that brings the work of immigrant journalists to public radio. Maritza, welcome to the show. Hi, Kai. So, Maritza, the obvious first question is how to explain what I just described. How is it possible that Latino voters in Arizona, many of whom are Mexican immigrants like yourself, would even consider voting for candidates from a party that's responsible for this really harsh anti-immigrant politics? Kai, it is a question that a lot of people are asking. And to begin to understand where we are, how we arrived to this moment, we need to go back in time at least 10, 12 years. On April 23rd, 2010, I was in the same room when Republican Governor Jan Brewer signed SB 1070. That law criminalized an undocumented person just for being in Arizona. If someone was stopped and could not show like a driver's license, a U.S. passport, a green card, a social security card, could be arrested and deported. We needed to be carrying our documents everywhere. It was controversial, yes, but later that same year, Brewer was reelected as Arizona governor. At the press conference after she signed SB 1070, Governor Brewer was asked how police were supposed to identify undocumented immigrants. She didn't have an answer, but for Latinos in Arizona, the answer soon became clear. SB 1070 wasn't just targeting immigrants. I think it's important to know that it was because of our, the color of our skin. It was pure racial profiling. Karina Ruiz is personally familiar with racial profiling. She has brown skin. She was a student at the time and went on to become an immigrant rights activist. She immigrated to Arizona with her family from Mexico, and she was, and still is, undocumented. 
you know, if you listen to Mexican music, uh, it was like a cue uh, for police to uh, assume that you could not have uh, a legal status. And it was also targeting citizens, citizen Latinos, Latinas that live in the state. And that's what I think prompted people to realize that the attack wasn't just on immigrants. The attack was on Latinx, brown, people of color. And I know that in those efforts in, in the big marches and, and the efforts that happened, a lot of leaders um, started in the movement. Yeah, honestly, Marisa, I remember that moment really clearly, and it really felt like a turning point in the racial justice movement in general, but particularly in the immigrant rights movement, that SB 1070, this, like, the strictest law in the country, right, led to just this massive amount of organizing. That's right, Guy. Actually, SB 1070 really was a wake-up call for Latinos, whether they were undocumented immigrants or families who had been living in Arizona for generations. Mm. There was a lot of fear of those sons and daughters of undocumented immigrants, the kids that were born and raised with mixed-status families, first-generation or U.S.-born Latinos. They transformed this fear into a lucha, a fight. They were canvassing, they were protesting, they were fighting for their rights, right. and they became a movement. Reina Montoya was a dreamer then, and she became part of that movement, and she actually founded a nonprofit organization to help those dreamers to achieve not just a temporary solution for the immigration status, but a permanent path for being here in this country legally. And she became part of that movement too, to protect voting rights, even though she cannot vote. I think what changed was a whole community that got activated and they said, we either have a choice, we either can continue to remain to be in the shadows or we can take action. And that's what I saw a lot. I, you couldn't just turn a blind eye and pretend that it didn't impact you. You would hear, about your cousins, your neighbors, either getting in deportation proceedings or having that palpable fear. So I felt what really changed was that uh, people like me, right, said like, we can't take this anymore and we have to make a choice. Either we continue to live in fear or we do something about it. So the people who made the choice to fight back then, what did they do? What, 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 what did they do and what were their results? I remember, Kai, back then, there was a group of ladies holding a vigil outside the state capitol, and they were praying, they were organizing, mm. but they stayed there for more than 100 days. One of them was Petra Falcón. She founded Promise Arizona, a nonprofit organization that actually wants to fight for this path to citizenship, to worker protections, and to have more Latinos registering to vote, and not just registering, but actually voting. Mm. But we were also at the same time training. We were doing a lot of what we call movement building training to get to get young people integrated into the movement as we called it locally and nationally. So that's how you got a lot of people running for public office in the next general cycle of the of, of, of the election. So we got many more people in, in, in the in the Arizona legislature, in the House and the Senate uh, elected to, to become state senators and state representatives. Um, which basically also gave the community some immediate wins. That's interesting. And, you know, it, correct me if I'm wrong, Maritza, I, I, as I remember this movement that launched, it had some very real political wins. I mean, the author of SB 1070, Senate, State Senator Russell Pierce, he was defeated in a recall election, right? And, and then the infamous sheriff of Maricopa County, uh, which includes Phoenix, Joe Arpaio, who he was the face of this law, really. He also lost political power in the course of this. There's a new sheriff in town. And I remember there was a real feeling of, of success, Guy. Actually, Petra and the Dreamers that we were been talking to were part of these recall efforts and helped to take Russell Pierce out of the office and elect a another Republican, actually. And a couple of years later, they did something similar with Arpaio. And I think most of us here in Maricopa County, we we remember that Adios Arpaio campaign. 
It was really one of those moments nationally, too, where you had this, like, euphoria uh, amongst, particularly in the racial justice world, of, like, oh, my God, this could there, there, there can be change. Something could really happen. Very sort of Obama-era kind of enthusiasm. But here's the thing where it says, so now it's more than a decade later, and, like, many of those moments of euphoria... Uh, from the Obama era, it feels like there's been a turn. We're hearing news and polling about the idea that there's going to be this unexpected increase in Latino support for conservative, like conservative, conservative Republican candidates. What What is going on? And I would love to have that answer. But to answer that question, I'm going to let Pedro de Velasco do all the talking. Pedro works with a group called Kino Voter Initiative in the Nogales area, and he works actually in both sides of the Mexican border. The mythical Latino vote. I think this is a very Anglo concept. It's sometimes difficult for Americans to comprehend that Latinos are very different from each other. Latinos come in all shapes, colors, smells, flavors, rhythms, and a diversity of backgrounds. When we talk about Latinos, we're talking of more than 20 different nations. And in each of these nations, people have a diversity of background. I mean, one person does not vote the same just from being from Mexico, from Colombia, or from Venezuela. I believe that it is important to move away from the idea of the Latino vote, because even migrants who naturalize as U.S. citizen, they're not voting for or against this or that candidate or policy just for coming from abroad. Guy, let me put this in perspective for you. More than 7 million people live in Arizona, and Hispanics represent about a third of the population. We are more than 2 million. Organizations that promote that empower the Latino vote estimate that about 640,000 Latinos will vote in these midterm elections. They're really important. And this is a significant number. This is huge. Compare that to 2002. In just two decades, the Latino vote in Arizona has increased by 400 percent. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that that is massive. Exactly. And everybody talks about it as if they knew it. But actually, Latinos are getting more independent. There are polls going around. Everybody is asking these questions, and they assume the Latinos are going to vote for Democrats. But in these primary elections, we actually realize that we know nothing. 45% of Latinos are affiliated with the Democratic Party, and that's, that's something that we know. But... Two of every five Latinos are not affiliated with any party. Mm. They're independents. So we need to understand that because we're not all the same. There are families that just speak Spanish. Many families, they don't. Many families that have been living in Arizona forever, but most of them just got here or they go back and forward and to cross the border. Mm -hmm. So the Latino voter is... It's not the same. It's not a monolithic, and that's something that we know. And we don't care about the same things. For example, everybody thinks that we just care about immigration of the border. But actually, economy is one of the most important issues for us. Right. And let me introduce you to Felix Garcia. He's a Latino Republican. He is young. He was born in Mexico, but came to Arizona. He became a pastor. He has a consulting business with Republicans, most of them. <laughs> he became a political analyst. And now he's actually representing the new face of the Republican Party here in Arizona. And I sat down with him shortly after the primaries, and this is what he told me. So now I think the, the, the Latinos, we more focus, you know, in job opportunities, because if you have opportunities, you know, if you have security, you, you, your family is happy um, with the community every single day, you know, and the reality, jobs is very important for that community, you know, jobs, house, security, you know, is the, the three uh, more important uh, issues, not the immigration not anymore. Which is to say that Latinos in Arizona are like most other human beings. They're worried about stuff that directly impacts their daily lives. And for many, immigration policy just isn't on that list right now. Still, we know that polls are notoriously inaccurate. And in any case, we can certainly overstate the idea of Republican support amongst Latinos. I mean, as you said, the vast majority are independent or Democratic voters. 
But if Latino voters do help elect Republicans who are going to roll back the gains of the past 12 years in the state, where does this leave the activists who have been working all this time to register voters and encourage Latinos to participate in politics in the first place? I also asked Reina Montoya about this. Remember, she came out of the movement to fight SB 1070. She knows that we made some progress in Arizona, but that progress may be reversed. She talked about Kerry Lake, the Republican candidate for governor in Arizona, and that candidate has promised that if she gets elected, she will finish up the border wall. But Montoya takes a long-term view of Arizona politics. So I think that even though that there's been some progress made, uh, we're seeing a little bit about post the Trump wave, how uh, nationalism and anti-immigrant sentiment continues to be on the rise. So I think that right now what we're experiencing in Arizona, it's a little pendulum, right? It's like it was very anti-immigrant. We saw that wave. We saw the pendulum swim the other way and saw a little bit of progress and more education being done. And then now it's kind of up in the air. We don't know where the pendulum is going to swing. It's going to swing to someone like Carrie Lake that has very similar policies and ideologies, or is it going to be moderated? So, and just like Reina said, the coin is in the air. It can go either way. And you know what? It is because politicians have taken and candidates have taken the Latino vote for granted or they don't care about it or they act as they don't care about the Latino vote. But in these elections, is if that 640,000 actually go out and vote, we're going to see how, what we can expect for the next 2024. There are going to be huge elections in Arizona. And as we said, it can go either way. Maritza, thanks for this reporting. Thank you, Kay. Maritza Felix is the founder of Connecta Arizona, a Spanish news service based in Phoenix. She comes to us through Feet in Two Worlds, a project that brings the work of immigrant journalists to public radio. Notes from America is a production of WNYC Studios. Follow us wherever you get your podcasts or on both Instagram and Twitter at Notes with Kai. And hey, if you heard anything you want to chime in about this week, you can leave us a voice message right on our website. Just go to notesfromamerica.org and look for the record button. Special thanks to Feet Into World and John Rudolph for editing help this week. Our live engineer was Matthew Mirando, mixing and music by Jared Paul. Our team also includes Karen Frillman, Regina Dehir, Vanessa Handy, Rahima Nasa, Kusha Navadar, and Lindsay Foster-Thomas. And I am Kai Ray. Thanks for spending time with us. <laughs> <laughs>